Coach, all the way live from Oakland, California. This is Revolution. So thank you guys for your patience. Once again, I'm a little late getting the episode out for patrons. Usually the episode is up 7 a.m. I apologize. Uh, I got my second COVID vaccine today, or my second shot today, so I'm a little loopy. Did the show tonight. As I'm recording this, it is Tuesday evening, May 18th, and we just got done doing a great show with Professor Kelly Dietz. But this show that you're about to hear is not that show. This is actually a show from about a week ago Um, on the live show. We had Paul Heidemann, uh, who is a history teacher who writes for Jacobin. He's a scholar on black American history. And we did a show about how the Red Scare really changed the projection. I shouldn't say projection. Changed the direction, sorry, of... The civil rights movement, kind of getting those guys, getting the socialists and the communists out of the movement, changed a lot of the uh, things they were fighting for from more class-based things. I should say things they were fighting for. The the, uh, laws... And the amendments, the bills they were fighting I'm so sorry. <laughs> the bills they were fighting for, um, going from class-based uh, to more inclusion-based, right? We do have some great legislation that has passed during the Civil Rights era, right? The Fair Housing Act, the Civil Rights Act. But when you look at the march on Washington and the cross coalition of all the different movements that were represented in the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. We always forget the jobs and freedom part. And who was the big organizer in that? A. Philip Randolph. Socialist A. Philip Randolph. So... We take a deep dive into civil rights era, kind of pre-King, and then what happens during the the King and post-King years when McCarthyism really kicks in. We don't really talk about how the Red Scare affected the civil rights movement. I mean, one thing I try to do with this show is reconnect a lot of black people to their socialist past. And not just in the sense of kind of, you know, an ideal of of uh, what you think the Black Panthers are through the lens of, you know, movies like Judas and the Black Messiah and a lot of, of the other imagery that is, is often shown, but like truly even, you know, before the 70s and the 20s and 30s. So this is our talk with uh, Paul Heidemann hope you enjoy if you want to see this stuff live then you have to subscribe to our youtube channel youtube.com backslash this is revolution podcast every tuesday at 6 p.m pacific standard time every thursday at 6 p.m pacific standard time and the saturday free show where we go longer than an hour every saturday morning for me 9 a.m And that's always a bigger show. The Saturday crew generally is me, Pascal Robert, 
uh, Paul Prescott from Jacobin, Marcus from the Left Flank Vets, and Angela Walker, Green Party Vice Presidential Candidate. What? What? So the Saturday crew is so thick, we don't even need to have a guest. And then we throw guests on on top of that. So this Saturday, we'll be speaking with uh, Kashama Sawan. So as you're listening to this, you'll listen to this, most of you, on Wednesday, May 19th. So on May 22nd, go to YouTube.com backslash This Is Revolution Podcast, and you can ask questions. participate in the conversation it's a lot of fun so thank you guys for taking the time to check this out I am going to fade out and you're going to hear a video well you're going to hear it you're the audio from it but uh, there's a intro video that was made to kind of explain the episode Um, If you are a YouTube subscriber, you're seeing more of these. I'm trying to do them for every episode. I cannot guarantee that. Um, It's a lot of work. Pascal and I actually have taken on a new project we're going to be doing with Zero Books um, called The Dispatch. It's the title we're working with right now, and it is a video essay series in the vein of uh, Zero Books' Critical Cuts. Uh, jokingly, one of the patrons of the show, uh, Joanna, calls me Black Adam Curtis. That's where these videos have been coming out. So, this is an episode I really dug. Paul Heidemann. There's links in the description to his Jacobin articles. This is Ty Hockey's intro, the only intro I play that I didn't write, and I am out. History was written today, which will have its effect on coming generations with respect to our democracy, respect to our ideals, with respect to the great struggle of man toward freedom and human dignity. There were many who praised this day and said that there had been a new awakening in the conscience of the nation. Others The traditional narrative of the civil rights movement centered on Martin Luther King and the NAACP is often repeated to highlight liberal reform at the Jim Crow racial order that gripped America at that time. However, few Americans are aware of how much radical black labor activists challenging the domination of capitalism were integral in demanding solutions rooted in political economy as a means to address the conditions of blacks in the United States. 
In this episode, we will discuss how the McCarthy era anti-communist fervor blunted the efforts of black radicals to achieve solutions rooted in the economic reality of black life. This is Revolution. All right, good evening. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of This is Revolution. Let me introduce my co host, my homie, my dog. He wasn't here last week. He is definitely here today, out of the writing gym, Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings. Peace and greetings. Jason, so Joanna called me Jason Adam Curtis Miles. Yes. I totally bit all that from Adam Curtis. Uh, hopefully it is more entertaining than what we usually watch because Pascal is not a fan of Adam Curtis. Uh, <laughs> let's bring in our guest today. We actually uh, hit up this gentleman some time ago when I wouldn't say when the article came out, but when the article hit hit us for I don't know how it hit us. Um, it was an article about um, the civil rights movement and some of the people that kind of got kicked out of the civil rights movement. He is a writer for Jacobin and a, and a history teacher in New York, Mr. Paul Heidemann. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. We were, Actually, we really, really dug the piece. Um, it definitely tackles something that uh, Pascal and I talk about probably more in our own private conversations than we get a chance to on the show. Um, it's definitely a period in the civil rights movement that I don't think gets uh, enough coverage. Actually, before the show, I was watching, I don't know how, how old you are, Paul, when I was a kid growing up around February when all the good black documentaries come out. I watched a show when I was very young on PBS called Eyes on the Prize, mm -hmm. which documented the civil rights struggle in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I was noticing, that, and, I, and I didn't rewatch all of it, um, but one thing that uh, kind of struck me was it kind of just eliminates this period and definitely doesn't cover uh, certain figures. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love Eyes on the Prize. Uh, you know, some of that footage and interviews are, are oh. just absolutely incredible. But it's very much of what some people call the Montgomery to Selma narrative, right? Mm -hmm. That the movement starts in uh, 1955 in Montgomery, mm -hmm. ends in 1965 in Selma. Um, and that's the civil rights movement, you know, a nice 10 years um, right there. And then Eyes on the Prize, I think, is, yeah, something that very much plays into that. When, of course, uh, the struggle against Jim Crow had been going on uh, for you know, a very long time, right? People have written about like uh, boycotts against segregated uh, streetcars in Louisiana in the 1910s, right? So the struggle against Jim Crow was long running. But really, that struggle gathered force in the late 1930s and in the, in the 1940s. Um, and really, after World War II reached a peak that um, you know fell off very quickly and wouldn't be reached again uh, until about a decade later. So that that first wave of the movement is really not very well understood um, or, or very widely known, you know, outside of basically a few academics. Even even among activists on the left, unfortunately, that history has really been lost. And so that, that's why I wrote this article. Um, and I think there's there's kind of two points that I really wanted to make in it. The first is that um, there was this, this very radical movement, right? Um, that was for, the, for whom, for the, the activists in this movement, it was completely natural to talk about changing the political economy and changing the racial order as part of the same project, right? And, and it was widely understood that in fact, you couldn't change the racial order in any significant way without drastically changing the political economy of the country, without drastically changing the balance of power between exploiters and exploited. Um, that, was, that was taken for granted in, this, in the milieu of this movement. 
And uh, the, the second point I wanted to make was that actually this was destroyed by anti-communism and by McCarthyism. Yeah. Right, that yeah. the, the shape and the politics of the civil rights movement that we understand was actually decisively shaped by anti-communist repression. And I wanted I wanted to read a kind of the opening the kind of I want to read the opening paragraph of your piece. Um, in the 1940s, the movement for black equality made its biggest stride since Reconstruction. In 1941, prodded by a socialist, A. Philip Randolph's March on Washington movement, Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802 banning discrimination in the defense industry and establishing a fair employment practices committee. It was the first substantive federal commitment to civil rights since the 1870s. In the courts, the NAACP's legal team won rulings against the white primary system and against racially reconstructive housing covenants. In just six years, the NAACP went from 50,000 members to 450,000. One result of this ferment was a narrowing of the black-white wage gap at a speed not approached since. Now, one quick question. Uh, can you explain, just real quickly, you don't have to get too in-depth. What is the white primary system? What was it? So the white primary system was the central political pillar of Jim Crow in the South. So, you know, in after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, um, a couple amendments were passed. 13th, 13th amend, Amendment was passed, getting rid of slavery, right? No more slavery. 14th Amendment says, if you're born on American soil, you're a citizen, right? You're, you're a citizen, which made all of the former slaves into citizens, right? And the 15th Amendment says, you cannot deny the right to vote based on skin color right and so for the south this was you know these the, these were kind of a legal problem how do you reestablish white supremacy how do you how do you try and you know drive the um the the black freedmen back into something as close to slavery as you can make it in the face of these legal barriers and you know they came up with a lot of things like um uh you know if you're poll taxes, for example, you had to pay to vote, literacy tests for voting. But one of the central ones was that the Democratic Party uh, by 1900, 1910 was established as the only party in the South. The, the Republican Party and the populists were driven out via white terrorism. And the Dem so the Democratic Party was the only party that stood a chance. So for all practical purposes, the Democratic primary was the actual election. And the Democratic Party is a private organization, right? Their primaries are not uh, the run by the government, right? So they can do whatever they want in their primaries. So they said, well, you know, black people may be able to vote in federal elections, but our primary is not a federal election. It's our own private thing. And so black people can't vote in it. And that was upheld as law until the 1940s when that was, when that was invalidated. So this central legal pillar of Jim Crow was struck down actually in the 1940s, two decades before um, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, etc. Gotcha. Pascal, did you have a question? I'd like you to explain the role of the black socialists and communists in this particular era in terms of their politics, mm -hmm. because there's so much effort has been made in the kind of Sanders moment to make socialism mm -hmm. and Marxism or left politics antithetical to black politics overall yeah. with comments like, like James Clyburn saying he's never met a black socialist. And I'd like you to really take some time to elaborate on the role of the, the black social and black communists and the black left at that time. And what was the basis of their politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this period, the black left um, starts growing really in the, in the depression, in the midst of the depression, right? As, as the questions of redistribution and of power become just so central that they can't possibly be ignored by anyone, you really get a, a blossoming black left. And there had been, you know, there have been black socialists in the United States going back to the 1880s, 1890s, you know, Peter H. Clark in the Socialist Labor Party in the 1880s, right, um, was, a, was a black socialist. So there have been black socialists for a very long time in the United States. But um, their numbers really pick up in the 1930s coming out of activism like um, particularly center focused in the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which was the union federation that had been founded in the 1930s um, on the basis of industrial unionism. So most American unions had been um, craft unions, which means they were organized like, you know, in a, in a factory, the per people who did one job were in one union, the guys who put the tires on were in one union, right? The guys who put the engines together were in a different union, right? Um, they were, the, the unions were based on occupational lines. And those kind of unions were very, very 
often very defensive, very aimed at kind of controlling who could get in to the profession as a way of regulating wages, right? You keep wages up by keeping people out of the profession. And of course, in you know early 20th century United States, who was kept out? Black workers, right? These, these unions were often basically white job trusts that uh, existed to keep black workers out. Well, when the CIO was founded, it was founded on a very different model of unionism. It was founded on the idea that everyone in, this, in, in one shop should be in the same union. And that meant that like black workers were often confined to the lowest, um, you know, the lowest paid rungs of the occupational ladder were now in the same union. And those unions understood uh, at their best that you had to fight for the rights of all workers in the shop. Otherwise, those divisions were going to kill you, right? The boss would use those divisions to kill you. And so as the CIO organizes, you get this layer of black union organizers, of black intellectuals who are who are going along with this movement, who are, are you know, are, are themselves socialists and are arguing for uh, the, that if we want to smash Jim Crow, if we want to destroy racism in the United States, we have to upend the power relationship that exists between boss and worker in this country. Right. Um, th those two things have to go together. Um, and, and for this entire layer, that, that was just common sense. And so, you know, some of these people were in the Communist Party, right? Like you had like um, you had some older intellectuals like Cyril Briggs, who was a Caribbean immigrant who had joined the Communist Party in 1921, right? And had been fighting for, for class struggle anti-racism for, you know, for decade by, by the time the Depression came around. Um, other people, you know, like A. Philip Randolph had been a member, was a member of the Socialist Party and was a leader of the National Negro Congress, which was essentially like a, a left coalition of black socialists and communists um, that were engaged in, in all of this kind of work. Um, and you had, you know, like people like W.E.B. Du Bois, who had been, you know, an important intellectual for three decades by that point, um, turning towards Marxism and writing his, his great book, Black Reconstruction, right? So you had this, this incredible ferment on both the intellectual and organizing level of Black socialists um, who were part of this movement to, to challenge Jim Crow and to, to win redistribution and win uh, uh, workers' power on the shop floor. Um, it, was, it was an incredible, uh, absolutely incredible milieu of people. Um, and, you know, people fought in the 1930s and the 1940s against Jim Crow. They fought to save the Scottsboro Boys, who were, um, you know, a group of, of black teenagers who were accused of rape falsely on a train in Alabama. Um, they fought that. And the people who fought those fights would go on to play central roles in the civil rights movement decades later. Like lots of people in the civil rights movement, you start looking into their background, you find out that they were a communist in the 1930s, right? Like Jack O'Dell, one of Martin Luther King's chief fundraisers, he was a communist, right? Um, and you find that again and again. Ella Baker, the woman who helped found SNCC, she was a member of a, of a dissident communist group in the 1930s called the Lovestoneites. So this milieu even when uh, you know they don't, they're, they're they're ultimately defeated by McCarthyism, which you know we can talk about later. Even when they don't win the changes that they were looking for, they go on to change history decades later. Only their their kind of political roots are often not recognized. Yeah, that's really a fascinating point you make. Can you distinguish particularly how the nature of this was different than the kind of liberal? Uh, should we have of the civil rights demands that came afterwards? Yeah. So, I mean, civil rights demands are fundamentally, the ones that we think about linked with the civil rights movement, fundamentally focused on the question of discrimination, right? Like black people being, um, you know, like the freedom rides, right? When, when these activists would get on these buses that were segregated, where, where black Americans had to sit, you know, in certain parts of the bus and would ride them um, all throughout the South. Right. These kind of laws about, you know, separate right, separate drinking fountains, separate bathrooms, um, voting laws, these kinds of, uh, of discriminatory laws were what the civil rights movement was was really, really focused on, particularly in its earlier days that uh, the movement itself evolves, of course. Um, and earlier, the, the vision of the movement was focused on those, but it was also centrally focused on the question of do black workers have enough to eat? right? Do black workers have access to decent paying jobs? Do black workers have uh, safe jobs, right? On the job safety. And so the, the movement was concerned with a fuller vision 
of the empowerment of black Americans and of black workers in particular. And of course, the vast majority of black Americans were workers, right? So in many ways, the, the vision of anti-racism that we get from the civil rights movement is one that was narrowed uh, from this wider vision in which um, you couldn't write, if you wanted, the, the, the activists in the 1930s and 1940s understood that in North Carolina, if you wanted uh, real change for black Americans, for, for black citizens of North Carolina, the, t the tobacco bosses could no longer be in charge of that state, right? Their power had to be dislodged, dislodged. It had to be dislodged politically in the ballot box, and it had to be dislodged on the shop floor as well. As long as they held absolute power over that state, um, the full rights for black Americans were impossible. And that vision was lost. Um, due to the repression of McCarthyism, right? It was that that kind of thoroughgoing holistic radicalism was split off from the movement by McCarthyism. It was no, the the idea that black rights, that black empowerment would require a transformation of political economy, was something that was pushed out of the movement, and that the movement itself had to rediscover in the mid '60s as it radicalized. So, did you did you have follow up to that, Pascal? I, I just wanted to say that what's interesting about the class makeup of the black working class in the 30s compared to professional managerial class elites in, this, in the, the 60s, I think is a very important point to distinguish as well. Do you think that's why the, the movement moves away from the A. Philip Randolphs to the Martin Luther King Juniors? I think that's part of it because mostly the reason I think it's part of it, but I think the, the McCarthy era uh, politics is the larger is the larger motivation, but I think that even even in the form the professional organization NAACP more rooted in political economy, the move away from that really is motivated more by the kind of anti left posture that the overall American politics take. Yeah, I, I really agree. And it was it was like union activists who are revitalizing the NAACP in the 1940s, right? Who are, who are really turning the NAACP into this incredibly mass rooted organization. So the there 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 wasn't this sense that like yeah the NAACP doesn't talk about political economy, right? Um, which in the 60s there like very much was, right? Um, in in the, in the 60s like Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP, his name became synonymous with moderation and for the for the black militants with cowardice, right? That wasn't the case in, uh, in in the 1940s, right? In the 1940s, there were a lot of militants leading NAACP branches across the country. Some of them were communist, a lot of them were communists, right? It's, it's actually in the, in the late 40s and the 50s that the NAACP basically purges commun the, the communists from its membership um, and, and in the process costs itself quite a bit of its membership. Well, also the, that original march, not original, but the, I guess you yeah. could say the second mark on March on Washington that uh, A. Philip Randolph pretty much put together, it was a cross coalition of mm -hmm. union movements and women's rights movements yeah. and, you know, so many, so many different movements to, to make that thing happen. And, and that's why he said, that, you know, there was a speech we were watching uh, last night on the, on the Ben Burgess show with, uh, with, Rustin and and uh, and A. Philip Randolph, you know, talking about why they wanted to call it the March for Jobs and Freedom, mm -hmm. and it kind of just gets remembered now as the March on Washington. And we don't even know who else spoke at the March on Washington, yeah. right? The only speech you get is a is the last sliver of a MLK speech, which, uh, as Tere had pointed out last night, was the second time uh, that he had tried that speech out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have something you want to add, Pascal? I mean, to the larger question, show us and tell us how McCarthy really affected politics. Yeah, so so McCarthyism, the level of political repression in the United States during McCarthyism is, I think, really hard for people to understand today. You know, the United States has always been a very politically repressive uh, country, you know, among kind of advanced capitalist democracies. But in the McCarthy era, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people lost their jobs um, and thousands and thousands more hid their politics. Um, you know, I have, I have a friend whose grandparents were communists and he said, you know, that after McCarthy, they burned their books and they, they never talked about communism again. You know, that was that was the level of fear people had um, that uh, of McCarthy, of J. Edgar Hoover, you know, of, of, of these goons um, coming for them. 
And so that that repression and, and that what, what I think is really important to understand is that repression carved lines into these organizations that had not existed before, right? So like in the CIO, there were lines between like the, the kind of liberal trade unionists and the communists and they fought, right? Um, and sometimes they worked together and sometimes they fought. When McCarthyism hit, a lot of the liberals saw this as their opportunity to get rid of their political rivals. And so in the CIO in 1948, um, a lot of the, the kind of most left unions endorsed Henry Wallace in 1948, who was running a left-wing uh, third party run for the presidency against Truman, um, as Truman is ramping up the Cold War. And the CIO leadership takes this as their opportunity to say, we're expelling these unions. And they didn't just expel these unions from the CIO, they, proce they proceeded to raid them, right? So like the United Electrical Workers, um, which is a very left-wing union that's still around today, um, they suddenly are in membership, are, are in union elections in which they're not only running against the boss, they're also running against this other CIO union that's saying, these guys are the communists, don't vote for them, we're the red-blooded American unionists, right? So this kind of, it, it, it launches this civil war in the labor movement in which the unions that were most radical, which were most committed to fighting racism in the labor movement and in society as a whole are pushed out, marginalized, and many of them ultimately destroyed over the next decade, right? They, they can't exist as independent unions anymore and they basically kind of disappear and merge with other unions. And so that atmosphere of, of political repression um, is one in which the black left is hurt the right. I mean, you can you can guess when you're hearing about this, that the, the black leftists get this the hardest. And um, so, you know, people like Paul Robeson, right, um, who was a, you know, uh, just <laughs> all around talented at everything guy. The great um, Paul after, Robeson that did nothing wrong ever. Yeah, who <laughs> was uh, like, um, you know, a lawyer, uh, a, a singer, an actor, just, uh, you know, amazing at everything. World class football player. Yeah, yeah. And was, was a committed uh, ally of the Communist Party. Um, and, a, and a real radical, you know, there's there's a riot at, a, at his uh, concert in New York that's like, you know, that's basically like this anti-radical riot that's like tearing up the town. And he's then hounded by the government and has a nervous breakdown, right? And so, and, and you, can, you can trace this out, you know, Paul Robeson was famous across the country. You can trace this out in the lives of people who weren't famous too, right? That same repression came for them and it hounded them. W.E.B. Du Bois is hauled before the court in his 80s in chains, accused of being an agent of a foreign power, right? Um, and again, all, there, there's, you know, so many anonymous black radicals who were pursued with that same level of, of repression. And, and whose ability to cohere a movement was destroyed as a result of it, right? The kind of institutional foundations for this movement were, were torn apart, right? The Council on African Affairs, which was um, this, you know, very radical anti-imperial, black anti-imperialist organization in the United States is destroyed by this repression. And because of that, you know, essentially what happens is some radicals are just totally, you know, pushed out, marginalized, sent to jail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, others learn to hide their politics, right? Others learn that if you want to continue to be active in politics, you can't talk about class anymore. You can't talk about redistribution anymore. You can't talk about capitalism anymore. And you certainly can't talk about socialism anymore. And that dynamic is what changes the, the, the kind of the, the, the political common sense of the movement, right? When the Montgomery bus boycott kicks off in 1955, the common sense of the movement had been changed, even as there was content like, you know, the, the, the real leader of the Montgomery bus boycott isn't Martin Luther King, it's E.D. Nixon, who was from the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, A. Philip Randolph's union. He was an old leftist. He was an old social, you know, he was an old socialist activist. But by the time the Montgomery bus boycott is kicked off, he and people like him knew you couldn't talk about that stuff anymore, right? And and he's also portrayed in the uh, Eyes on the Prize uh, documentary, a pretty prominent role in the documentary, because um, I think by the time they're filming it, you know, A. Philip Randolph has, has since passed away. Yeah. But again, he's not portrayed as a socialist. Mm -hmm. 
And again, that documentary, as informative as it is, if you want to hear a lot about Emmett Till and mm -hmm. bus boycotts, which are extremely important, um, you don't hear about the, the workers' struggles and any of the, even the union struggles. It basically kind of boils civil rights down to, and I, and I definitely want to get uh, your take on this as well, Pascal, because I know you remember the, the series. I know you are, you're older than me, so you probably weren't watching it like I was. Um, it, it, it turns the civil rights into a struggle about inclusion. And we, political power is never really challenged. It's just basically, how do we get to play the white man's reindeer games? And here are these very well-dressed, they speak so well, leaders of said movement that are gonna lead, lead, us, lead us to freedom. What is, what is, how do you feel when you see things like that, Pascal? I think it's propaganda. It's absolute propaganda based on trying to root black politics in liberal anti-racism instead of challenging the political economy that is rooted in keeping black people away from having economic liberty, freedom, and power. And that's the problem. And I think that our politics suffer that way today because of that. Because how do you, as a, as a teacher, Paul, and I'm not trying to, you know, I've never been in your class. I'm not trying to shit on you as a teacher or as a man. I'm literally just asking the question. I know you have to be dealing with children that if they have seen that docuseries, that is their understanding of the civil rights movement. And couple that docuseries with all of the movies that came out in the 80s and the 90s that I can't stand that are always about some white mm -hmm. man yelling out, you niggas will never swim in my pool. And that becomes what southern struggles are mm -hmm. how do you break that down and extrapolate this for high school children that that's a very small part of the struggle as pascal says if black politics are a politics of containment how do you <laughs> show them the broader picture what do you what do you first tell them about so I have my students, uh, I have my students listen to the radio series New World A Coming from the 1940s by Roy Otley, which was um, on the liberal side of the spectrum, but was very much connected to this, um, the, the, the kind of labor civil rights organizing in the 1940s um, to understand that, uh, and, and it, it's actually, it's an interesting, uh, listening to the, these old radio broadcasts, um, by these, you know, by these black journalists, these black radio journalists in the 1940s. I have them listen to the one on the Harlem riot of 1943, um, mm -hmm. which was a riot during World War II, um, you know, where a cop shot a black soldier. Very, very destructive riot in Harlem. One of the first, um, after 1935, one of the first modern kind of race riots, as we think of them in, in, in American history and the way we, we think of them today. Um, and the, the radio show is talking about this. And it's interesting because the radio show is like these liberals who totally support the road, these, these black liberals who support the Roosevelt administration. And they're very much making the argument that like, we understand that there are grievances, but like we have to win the war now. Now is kind of not the time for this rioting. This rioting only helps Hitler. And so, you know, that's an argument that they're making. But the way, the, the fact that they're making the argument mm -hmm. tells you how much militancy there was among black Americans at the time, right? That like, it couldn't be assumed that black Americans were like, oh yeah, we're gonna go fight World War II, right? Like there had to be a campaign to say, this is the right political goal, right? And this was of course, you know, the, uh, the Pittsburgh Courier, right? Of the, the double V campaign, victory against fascism uh, abroad and against racism at home, right? Mm -hmm. But there was, there was such militancy and bitterness among black Americans that that sentiment could not be taken for granted. It had to be argued for. Right. Um, so I, I like to teach that as a way of saying, like, there are these different political currents among black Americans. And that is a question of argument. Right. Um, it's not there, the, the idea like that there's a black community. Like, what did the black community think about racism in 1940 or 1945? Right. It's an incoherent question um, that, you know, that's I, I, I try and get my students to understand that, which, you know, to be honest, is hard to get them to understand because 
everything else they encounter in their lives on the subject of black politics is telling them the idea that like, no, there is a coherent black community that like has to be listened to, right? Instead of like class divisions, political divisions, that kind of thing. I also have them read Robert F. Williams' Negroes with Guns uh, about armed self-defense in the civil rights movement. Um, which, uh, which is a lot, is a book that teaches really well. You know, it's a memoir of armed self-defense, and it's essentially Robert <laughs> F. Williams saying why Martin Luther King was wrong about nonviolence. Now, are you teaching? And again, I don't know. I don't know your class. Or is these like a lot of a lot of colored kids in your class? Uh, no, no. I teach at a, at a mostly white school. Oh, damn. Okay, that's that's even more interesting. Uh, <laughs> so the black kid in class. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that's that's yeah, a common situation, definitely. <laughs> how is how do they usually respond to hearing this information for the first time? You know, they're 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 really interested in it. Um, you know, they have a certain idea of the civil rights movement that's very much romanticized, that's very much the kind of eyes on the prize vision. Although, you know, they they, they don't even know. They 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 have no idea. They got Obama it. elected, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, they're very pro Obama. Um and so, so yeah, you know, like they're, they're, and so I find most of the time when you introduce them to this much bigger world of black mm -hmm. politics, they think it's, they find it really, really interesting. Like, you know, I mean, who, any, anyone with a modicum of intellectual ambition in them is going to be interested by the debate between Robert F. Williams and Martin Luther King over nonviolence versus armed self-defense, right? Like that's exciting history. It's fascinating. And that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's tragic to me that that's not how black history is always taught, right? Um, that, that there is these, these politics of representation are so hegemonic and they actually just drain all the life out of the history. Pascal? A question about the, the popular front or United. And do you think that was a mistake mm -hmm. on the part of the radicals on the left to less with the liberals in the fight against fascism that eventually led to the bodies that neutralized the left? That was a bad strategy. Um. Yeah. I mean, I I think it's complicated. So you know, the popular front was the idea in the Communist Party in particular that um that kind of the struggle against fascism was paramount, and this was an idea that the communists adopted really from the mid 1930s onwards, with the brief exception during the the um, Hitler Stalin Pact when they became very very anti war and very very militant. Um, then after, of course, Hitler betrayed uh, Stalin and invaded the Soviet Union, the, the Communist Party went back to the, the kind of popular front line, which meant like kind of basically supporting Roosevelt, although never coming out and saying we support Roosevelt. And um, yeah, to be honest, I think I, I think it's a complicated question um, because the New Deal and, and Roosevelt certainly created really important opportunities uh, for, for struggle and advancement. That, that wouldn't have happened if, if the Republicans had come to power in 1936 or, or, or 1940. At the same time, there were huge costs to that strategy. So like during World War II in particular, the Communist Party are strike breakers, right? Anything that will hurt the war effort of the United States against Nazi Germany, the communists are the most militant opponents of. And so when like workers are going on strike during World War II saying, look, we're getting worked to death in this war effort. We want something to show for it, right? The Communist Party is like, get back to work. You know, the, the Communist Party members who are in unions are like, get back to work. You know, we will break up your unions uh, or we will break up your, your picket lines, et cetera. And that is absolutely devastating for the general kind of militancy and coherence of the American labor movement. And I think you're absolutely right. It makes the labor movement, and particularly the radical part of the labor movement, easy prey for McCarthyism just a few years later. Um, so, so that absolutely, I think, cost it. Um, you know, whether the, the popular front as a whole uh, was a mistake, I think is, is, is a bigger and, and more complicated question. But certainly it, it, the, the, the communist left adopted strategies that had tremendous costs um, and, and for which they suffered later. Um, and, you know, the, the Communist Party itself actually really downplayed the issue of, of racism during World War II. Um, well, so, I mean, here's an example. Like when, when A. Philip Randolph is leading the March on Washington, the first March on Washington, for the integration of the military and for the um, integration of defense industries, which was like most of the economy at the time, um, 
So when A. Philip Randolph is leading that march, you go and read the communist newspapers, read the Daily Worker. The Daily Worker is like A. Philip Randolph is a Hitler sympathizer, right? Like he he's like going against the effort to win the war. Why is he attacking Roosevelt right now? It's really nasty stuff. Really, really nasty stuff. And so absolutely that kind of stuff flowed from a, the popular front orientation of the party. And that stuff was just disastrous, just absolutely disastrous. Yeah, because prior to that, the communists were considered more radical on the race question than yeah. the socialists by far. Yes, absolutely. And 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 their posture during World War II made it easier for some of the more conservative uh, socialists and for liberals as well, for that matter, to say, see, they don't actually care about black rights. It's all instrumental for them. Much like we saw in 2020 uh, in the Bernie campaign. Uh, would the Hitler-Stalin pact have happened if the Soviet Union wasn't diplomatically alienated by the West? Well, that's a complicated question for a diplomatic <laughs> historian. I'm a, I'm a historian of, 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 of African-American labor history, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have an answer for that one, Pascal? Man, that's outside of my in terms of answering that question. <laughs> I said this is Jean. This is Jean Bajlan uh, question. Uh, that that's who that belongs to. Um, Joanna says that pack is overstated. Um, did you want, I'm sorry, Pascal. Do you want to follow up? You can ignore that last question. No, I, I, I'd like to hear Paul really kind of elaborate that kind of in this moment in which you know socialism is nominally making a rise in our current politics. How much our current politics on race, class, and capitalism is still affected mm -hmm. the way in which liberal anti-racism becomes the normative posture of Black politics in the 60s as a long tradition of Black left radical the situation of Black people in political economy, and how that kind of uh, very economically politics still manifests today. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I totally agree. I think there's no question that that kind of liberal anti-racism is uh, absolutely hegemonic on the uh, even on the left today, and even even among socialists, I would say that kind of um, uh, uh, you know liberal, very very liberal uh, stance is is totally hegemonic. Um, and I think yeah, I think you know even as people like it, it's a funny moment in this sense, like even as people are more concerned with ever with very material dynamics, like for example, the, the racial wealth gap, right? Even as, as people are really concerned with that, a, a broader understanding that the politics of redistribution are what is central to improving the lives of black Americans is in, in some ways as distant as it ever was, right? So like, just like the, the, the basic fact that, for example, unions are a bulwark of wage equality, right? That like when, when you have unions, you have a much smaller gap between black and white workers, right? Something like a, a, as simple as that is, I think that, that kind of thing remains very far outside of most conversations about how, uh, how to fight racism in the United States, right? Um, and I think until that understanding, which was common sense, you know, in the 1940s among, among so many black activists, until that understanding is common sense again on the left, it's going to be an uphill battle to organize the kind of fights we need to organize that will actually improve, you know, the vast majority of black people's lives in this country, right? Um, so, yeah, I think these kind of politics of representation of black faces in high places, right? Um, absolutely rule. And I think, you know, I, I think in a weird way, so much anti-racism today comes down to a weird form of etiquette of, of do you say the right words and, you know, do you, do you gesture to the right people and the right groups and that kind of thing instead of an actual program, right? Like what, what policies do we want that will, uh, that will, you know, uh, attack racial inequality in the United States. And, um, there, yeah, there's there's a highly discursive, one might even say performative element to so much anti-racism, and I think that you know that that has to be overcome if we're actually going to going to fight racism in the United States. Uh, I was on a show last night with uh, Ben Burgess and mm -hmm. uh, Teray Reed, 
and and somehow Robin D'Angelo came into the conversation mm. and uh, Burgess had made some comment about her teachings being like having a vision quest, a, a, a PMC vision quest into uh, some sort of performative, to your point, etiquette. And I think mm -hmm. that's what a lot of the anti-racism that she talks about is is about, um, which, which I find extremely silly. Uh, Pascal, you froze, you still there? I think you're absolutely right. And uh, so what exactly does this mean in terms of the current posture of uh, the so -called liberal anti-racist movement really address the material conditions that affect the lives of working class. We have the black political class, reparations, all these other kind of racial reductionist based programs, which uh, I believe Preston Smith would call democracy, which generally argue uh, uh, to the betterment of black uh, what exactly this mean in terms of the material condition of working class? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, I, I think so so many uh, of the anti-racist politics today are, are kind of bifurcated between white vision quests. I love that term. That's a <laughs> great term. White vision quests and black elites, you know, um, that like those those are the two sides that, that dominate so much of, of anti-racist politics today. Um, and yeah, I think that those are the people who benefit from representation matters politics, right? Like um, if, if the politics are, you know, we want, we want there to be one, one seat at the table is gonna be a black person. Well, that's gonna be, you know, a black person who went to Yale or something, right? Like that's not gonna, that's not gonna be the kind of politics that actually delivers change. Like I, I live in Flatbush, right? Like in, in, in Flatbush, the, the, those representation matters politics are not improving the lives of most people. Right. Um, those those kind of uh, uh, politics just don't deliver. And those kind of those, those kind of politics are often actively hostile to redistribution. Right. To like I mean, we saw this during the during the Bernie campaign. Right. Just like the insane hostility to talking about redistribution. Right. And to saying that, like a lot of the problems, uh, a lot of the, the, the kinds of oppression that black Americans face would actually be remedied by redistribution. Right, well, like people need more money, right? Feel like people need to be able to pay their bills, to be able to pay rent, to be able to get decent medical care. That's what people need, right? Um, and and the idea, and, and but um, among like you know like you know in New York right now, right? Um, Eric Adams is is running as the, the the candidate of the the Black Brooklyn political machine. He's he's not That's very cop, interested right? in redistribution. That's the cop, right? Yep. 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 And, and here's 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 a here's a question. Someone asked this question, and, and, and you know, I want to get your take on this. They're they're basically asking uh, any tips for raising awareness of a class-based black politics without getting called. And I'm I'm asking this also uh, to Pascal as well, uh, being called a racist uh, by black elites or white libs. So here, I'll even put it up on the screen so you guys can see. <laughs> We we got to you know the root of the condition of black working class political economy, and we've got to expand a black left that includes more working class black folk. That's the key. Mm -hmm. but, but I guess this question is kind of like from the standpoint of what happens when you are in a discussion with the eye. Let's just call them the eyes on the prize crowd. <laughs> the eyes on the prize crowd that maybe they know King was a socialist, but still all they know of King might be. The letters from jail but they definitely know i have a dream and they know malcolm x had a gun how do you talk to these people about class politics because that is, that is an interesting to, yeah. question to ask i think this is what kicked bernie sanders in the ass when people were able to flip that script on him real quick and say no 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 you have to address me you know, what, what do you say or, I'm sorry, Pascal, what, what, there you go. Uh, Pascal, you started off. I think one of the things in particular about this episode is letting there was a time when America was even more racist. Black people rule politics and political economy. The book right now, what the Negro wants, which is 1944. And when you hear the, 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 the debates that the authors are having, it's rooted in political economy. No one's talking about racism. 
racism, white supremacy, jobs, economic, you know, feasibility, healthcare, material demands, and that this posture that we have right now is a product of how liberal and weak Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, Paul. Did you, did yeah. you, how do you how do you handle that, Paul? Because the person that's asking the question, they said, look, I'm a white guy and, mm-hmm. and I get tired of getting caught. My daughter, I am not a white man. My daughter uh, called me a class reductionist the other day. Well, I mean, uh, you and know, I grounded her. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't keep growing. I did not. I did not. I think you got to be ready to be called that. You're going to get called that. You're going to get called a class reductionist. You're going to get called, you know, if you're white, you're going to get called like someone who wants to ignore race. And I think, yeah, I think knowing that history, that, that's why I think this history is so important. Like, was Martin Luther King a class reductionist when he said, you know, we have to question uh, the economic edifice that produces poor people, right? Was, was he a class reductionist when he said that, right? Was was uh, was Malcolm X a class reductionist when he said, you know, you show, you show me a capitalist and I'll show you a bloodsucker, right? Um, there, I, I, there's, a, there's a history here, um, the, and, and it's the actual history of black struggle in the United States in the 20th century is a history in which socialism is at the absolute core of that struggle. The civil rights movement would not have happened without socialists organizing it, right? Without people who learned how to organize in the unions as socialists. They were the ones who organized the civil rights movement. You know, like my friend uh, Matt Nichter just published an article in, in Labor, uh, the, the uh, journal about um, Emmett Till. Do you know what the first rally that uh, that Mamie Till Bradley, Emmett Till's uh, mother, spoke at after Emmett Till was killed? It was. It was yep. sponsored by the United Packing House Workers, the mm. militant black and white union in Chicago. That was the first rally that she spoke at. And the packing house workers were central to, to putting the message out there about what had happened to Emmett Till. They sent an interracial delegation down to Till's trial, right? You can imagine how that was turning heads in, uh, you know, down, down south in, in, 19, in the early 1950s, right? Um, this is the actual history of the struggle for black equality in the United States. It's the history of a struggle in which political economy was at the center in which socialists were at the center. And I think, you know, you're when you bring that history up today, you're going to get called names, right? But like, I, if, if you know that history, you, you have to be steeled in that, right? You have to know, like, this is the tradition that we are trying to build on, right? Um, and, and you have to be proud of that. So I like, I mean, partially my advice is like, be ready to get called. Like I've, I've long ago accepted that every time I write a Jacobin article on race, people are going to respond, oh, here's someone for Jacobin again saying we should ignore race. Even as I'm telling the actual history of the struggle for black equality that you're, you're not going to get from, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're certainly not going to get from Robin D'Angelo and you're not going to get from Ibram Kendi either. Right. Um, so, yeah, you, you know. Don't make me pull out Ibrahim Kendi. <laughs> I will read a verse. If you like. uh, how would you answer that question, Pascal? If somebody says, on. "Well, let me let me say this." Mm-hmm. So I was watching it. I'll ask you again. I'll ask this to the to the people watching the show. Give me your your response to this in the chat, and I'm definitely going to ask this to both my guests. I'm watching a show of some young black leftists. And they are going on about how class is race. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, being black is to be a permanent underclass. It's almost like some sort of caste discussion. Mm -hmm. So I chimed in on a chat and I said, well, what about Oprah buying her $38,000 purse? And, uh, And, you know, for them it was, well, they discriminated against her therefore we are right being black is being a permanent underclass how would you answer a question like that pascal i mean that position is always used to neutralize the position that exists by people and it's actually an illusion to make it seem like those who are class enemies of the poor and working it works to the benefit of the black political class it's a very dangerous way of looking at the quote unquote unit community, which doesn't exist. So what do you say then when these people say, well, hey, Jay-Z is literally a billionaire and the police 
you know, look at him as just another N word. What, what do you then say? Basically, if you look at the chances in which someone who has that kind of level of wealth or Asian being interfaced with the police, I mean, James Foreman talks about this. A black person who doesn't have a high school diploma compared to a black with a copy of college education has something like almost 10 times more of a likelihood to enter than a college educated black person. These, these There's a difference in terms of of how different classes of people interact with capitalism and police in this country. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have stories of you know Henry Louis Gates, uh, police messing with him in his driveway, Chris Rock getting pulled over in his very well-to-do neighborhood. Again, isn't this proof that race is yeah, class? Well, wow. Do they live in the same condition that working class folk do in neighborhoods dealing with that kind of reality daily? Or are they kind of just exceptions to the rule? You didn't want to go you know. on more? I... <laughs> <laughs> Paul, did you want to elaborate? Yeah, I mean, there was actually just a great article that was that came out about um, life expectancy in the U.S. And life expectancy, uh, the gap between black and white is shrinking and the gap between educational levels is growing. So if you look within educational categories, working class people, black and white, their life expectancy is converging at a lower level and college educated people, black and white, their life expectancy is converging at a higher level, right? So you, you, you see um, as this is going on, the that the the it, it, it's just not true that race is class like and it's you know i i mean that argument is is offensive right like that the condition of black working class people is the same as henry lewis gates that's offensive like like that's just so far from reality like when is the last time henry lewis gates had to think about whether he could make rent this month you know um like that is the that is the daily life pumping out all these pbs documentaries about slavery still He's got like 15. Uh, so, so, rent. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, baby, I don't know if we're gonna make rent this month. I guess we did another 18 part series on slavery. <laughs> this time from the perspective of the boat captain. <laughs> <laughs> Pascal, you wanna add something before we go? Oh man, I sound laughing at your uh Henry Louis Gates interpretation is pretty. <laughs> That's Henry Louis Gates. What he says when he's not in front of a camera, he gets very, very ghetto. At least Obama's <laughs> book said it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know Skip Gates. He always says fuck the police. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, was there anything you wanted to show before we go? Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to show right now. You, you've caught me in between shillables. Um. <laughs> are you are you uh so you're in new york has everything kind of calmed down are you are you walking around yeah. now i guess now? i can you know, if, if people want to check out my book class struggle oh. in the color line it's a it's oh, an yeah. edited collection of writing on um uh, by american socialists on the race question in the early part of the 20th century um check it out class struggle in the color line it's god just, damn it go Steve, but. you are a motherfucking G. I appreciate you more than you know. Me and Pascal appreciate you more than you know. Uh, thank you, brother. Um, yeah, see, okay, now, Paul, first of all, you got this shilling thing all wrong. All the other cats got to put the book on front of the bookcase so they know you wrote a book. Yeah, yeah right, right. They, all, right. Yeah, they like to, like, set it up in the, in the front like that. I, I, I didn't, I forgot to do that. <laughs> I'm new to shilling. Give me, give me time. Uh, so I want to ask you a question. If you say no, totally understand. It is late where you are in uh, in New York City. Uh, we usually do this show for about an hour. Then the next hour we go into what we call the after hours, the bonus half, where we talk a little more shit. And since it's patrons only, <laughs> we use a lot more expletives when we talk said shit. <laughs> um, so if you like, and, and we this stays on the patron side. So if you want to, if you can, we'd appreciate you. I would, I would love to, uh, maybe at some point in the future, um, I, I'd be happy to. It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, this has been a lot of fun, but I do, I have to teach tomorrow. So, uh, <laughs> we gotta wake up early. yeah, I gotta get up early. Gotta get up early. Are you in class or are you zooming? Yeah, I go in. I, I'm going in. It's in person. You're going in? Yeah. You have so a hazmat I, suit? 
<laughs> no, no, I've got my little mask, you know, uh, but I'm vaxxed and stuff. So, um, yeah, I've been, every, I've been in, every day. Yeah. Yep. In person every day. No shit. Yeah, yeah. When a kid sneezes, do you so you panic? Is it like <laughs> no, beat I, sweat? <laughs> you, you don't last long if you panic every time a kid sneezes or something. You know, they're they're always doing stuff yeah. like that. That's that's I didn't know you guys were open like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Back to back to regular working hours. Uh, it, was, it was fun on Zoom. <laughs> Well, well, thank you very much, Paul. We, we, yeah, thanks we'd for like having me. Back. We'd like to this have was, you back. This was really a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Well, hey, have a good night, All Paul. Right. And uh, don't yell at them kids too much. All right. <laughs> All right Take care. Thank Bye-bye. You. That was Paul Heideman, writer for Jacobin, as you saw. Uh, teacher at a high school in Brooklyn. Uh, studies black politics in Pascal's favorite era of black politics, the 30s and the 40s. You were you were talking about today in a text chat. Actually, before we started doing this show, you were talking about that. That's correct. And so one of the things we've been talking about in our off-air production meetings is having um, a session for patrons only with Pascal. And I was thinking you should do something on Hubert Harrison. What do you think? That would be good. That would be a good conversation. Should we do it on like Discord? Discord could work. Are you guys down for that in the chat, patrons? Pascal on Discord doing a Hubert Harrison breakdown. Actually, Professor Barber, that's kind of your wheelhouse as well, or is that a little too far after uh, what you usually study? And we're trying to make this happen, if not the end of this month, then definitely uh, the beginning of, of June, because we still have to watch our movie for this month. Yep. Um, I'm starting to vote for the movie Z, friend of show and friend in real life, Adolph Reed uh, kind of recommended it. It's an, it's an old movie. You just keep saying that and then trying to use the Jedi powers to make us do it. <laughs> that's how that works we're naming out you like no nah, no nah, we're doing the cuba african odyssey that's what that's what pascal does on in our production calls so we we hit our hour thank you guys z no not z the zombie movie it's a it's a greek movie um about socialist struggles out there in the 60s? No, 40s, World War II. Um, so a, another friend had mentioned we should watch it as a Discord movie. It's a really good Discord movie, they thought, for what we do as a show. Um, Adolf actually said that he went back and watched all these older uh, films from the 60s, like Z, Battle of Algiers, Four Algiers. What's, there's, what's, there's another one where where the the people that you're rooting for would lose so to speak um he actually sent us an interesting video that's up right now um i'll i'll, I'll link it at some point and maybe when i put up this uh youtube video and thursday we're going to have on friend of show uh if you've been listening to this for when i was still doing it in studio and there's very few of you that have. Uh, a good friend of mine that actually works for the Electronic Intifada will be coming on uh, Thursday, and we're going to be discussing the goings on in Palestine right now, in Israel, because there's some crazy shit going on over there right now. Very, very sad. So we'll have Nora Barrows Friedman on Thursday, and Saturday we'll be discussing uh, the issues with the unhoused in LA. There's some really interesting legislation that got that was getting pushed back on by um, actual homeless rights advocates because the legislation was actually being written by uh, the real estate lobbies and developers that was to house the homeless, which really was a plan to kind of just round everybody up and get them the fuck out of the way so they can continue with some bigger uh, land projects. 
So we'll be talking about that Saturday. So we have an action-packed week. All right, Pascal, you ready? We're going to go into the bonus part for a little bit. Are we doing the bonus part? I thought we were yeah, oh, signing out. Yeah, yeah. You want to do the bonus part or no? I already got it up in the patron part. Oh, already you already got it up. If you already yeah. got it, we got to do it. All right. We nothing to it but to do it. All right. Thank you, guys. And we are out. <laughs>